Welcome back to Five Clubs Golf. I'm Gary Williams. This week, one of the special weeks in the game of golf. We've had to wait an additional year for the Ryder Cup. Additionally, it was scheduled, or originally scheduled, pardon me, of September of 2020. Obviously, the pandemic, they had to forward it one year. So it is this week. And when you consider all that's happened in the Ryder Cup, I go all the way back to 1979, First time it it really made any sense to me as to what was going on. And that was when continental Europe was added to the side with Great Britain and Ireland. And that included Seve Ballesteros. Now, the United States won that week at the Greenbrier. But if you fast forward to 1983, Lanny Watkins' wedge at Palm Beach Gardens. And then what transpired in 1987 at Mirrorfield Village was the first time that Europe had ever won on American soil when they wanted Jack's place, and Jack was the captain, and Jose Maria Lothabel did his little dance on the 18th green. That, I thought, kind of lit the match, but then it became an inferno in 1991 at Kiwa Island, what transpired there with Bernhard Langer missing the putt. If you consider how much Europe has dominated this event over the last 20 years, it's been since 1993 that the United States has won on the road now they're at home but they've only won twice in the last two decades 2008 at valhalla and 2016 at hazeltine and they got absolutely dusted in paris a team that a lot of people thought was not constructed properly because the golf course was going to be tight there was going to be a premium on hitting fairways and they had players like phil mickelson who was on the side who really struggled that week tiger woods also had a very difficult week coming off winning the tour championship now what is this week well to me the texture of this event comes down to two things the style of play that the United States is going to try to employ, clearly Steve Stricker decided that he was going with style of play. Guys who hit it long and hopefully are competent putters. Meanwhile, on the European side, these guys as a whole are modest in length, but what they're long in is winning experience. Poulter, Garcia, also McElroy, even John Ramos had the taste of winning as he did in Paris in 2018. This team knows no matter where it is that they are going to come in as an underdog on paper, and that's the case this week. The United States, on average, their world ranking, ninth. Europe, 30th. To me, I've always thought that was an overrated stat. This is not a 72-hole aggregate total of 12 players. This is funky, finicky match play, four ball and foursomes. And the, Europe, the European team has always simply done it better than the American team. Now, when it comes to television, the two guys who are going to lead the coverage on NBC, Golf Channel, and Peacock, one has been doing this for a long time on the TV side. The other guy was a member of the 1989 team, 91 and 93. Now, two of those teams won. He also captained the United States team in 2008 at Valhalla when they absolutely whitewashed Europe in Louisville, Kentucky. And that is Dan Hicks and Paul Azinger. They are my guests this week on the Five Clubs Conversation with Gary Williams. With that, we bring in Paul Azinger and Dan Hicks, the men who will anchor NBC's coverage of the Ryder Cup this week. Gentlemen, good morning. Hey, Gary. What's up, Gary? Well, guys, listen, the, the, there are special weeks in your careers. And, Paul, you know, you played in this thing. You know what it's like. And, Dan, you, you've called some of the, the best sporting events in the world. Dan, let me start with you. What is it about this event that gets you so excited? I, I think what gets me so excited, it's not like any other golf tournament. It's absolutely stands on its own. It is, I, I cannot tell you how many people I, I talk to through the course of the year, through my travels, talk about various golf tournaments, major championships that we do. We get to do a lot of big golf events, but I cannot tell you how many people <clears throat> are casual golf fans that wander into the Ryder Cup arena every year because they just see it on television and they can't take their eyes off of it. So they're cruising around the television stations and it's unlike any other golf tournament they've ever seen. So it is, it is, it has the it factor from the standpoint 
it's kind of like a mini Olympics of golf because it's 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 for country, but but it's just got so much electricity to it that it just is so much different from any other golf tournament we do. You know, Paul, your indoctrination of this thing was 1989, and prior to that, there had never been even live coverage of this event when it was overseas. So what was your baptism like back then in 89? That's actually the first time I ever heard that. I didn't even realize, you know, that it wasn't on live. Um, but uh, it makes sense. You know, the Ryder Cup, they say that 91 really put the Ryder Cup on the map, the, the war on the shore and, and all that. Uh, in the United States, it was always a big deal in Europe for them. And they won on home soil in 87. And I remember that distinctly. I wasn't on that team. I, I could have been on the team, but I wasn't a, an official member of the PGA of America, even though they made me PGA player of the year in 1987. I wasn't on the team, but I, I was aware of the celebration and who the players were that were celebrating on the European side. I think a bunch of us kind of took it personal in 89. So I was already kind of had a chip on my shoulder about the Ryder Cup. And then I experienced, you know, playing Faldo, who I'd lost to at the Oak Championship, and Woosnam, who those two had never been uh, beaten. Chip Beck and I beat them, so that was a great experience. And then I drew Seve. You know, for me, my Ryder Cup experiences were fantastic always because I drew, it seems like I just got either lucky or unlucky. I always say lucky, that I always seem to draw their toughest players, their best players, and singles. And so 89, when I beat Seve, that changed my life, really. Yeah, beat him one up uh, over there, which, like you said, I mean, it's it's a big deal. You're then known uh, to all those players, even though they were familiar with you from 87 and obviously in the Open Championship. Uh, Dan, 91, uh, Paul brought it up. Um, as far as that one being the one that really lit the match, is that where the big pivot came, in your opinion? No doubt about it. I think it, uh, it took on a personal thing in 91 in Kiwa, it, it, it brought, again, people that hadn't watched much golf, saw what was happening on Kiowa, saw the drama of it. And it was just something like out of a movie. You can't, you can't even, you can't even write a script like that. The way it all unfolded with Hale Irwin and Bernhard Langer, of course, the putt at the end was as much, much excitement that I think <clears throat> everybody had seen in the game of golf ever for a lot of casual golf fans that were just kind of discovering the Ryder cup. And the fact that it all unfolded, you know, on national television, on NBC, um, was another another great thing about it because I don't think people really knew much about the Ryder Cup until the build up to that one and the way it delivered put everybody over the edge. And I think it forever changed the path of the Ryder Cup to where it is even now today. Paul, ninety one for you. The 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 situation you and Chip Beck, uh, Seve and Ola Thabel, uh, that that footage is going to be shown this week. Uh, you can count on it. Uh, Tommy and Tom, I'm sure, have got it edited. They've got it queued up. There's gonna, they're going to show the little confrontation between uh, you guys regarding the golf ball. Um, is, as far as Seve and his gamesmanship, is he the most important figure that was inserted into this thing when they became available, uh, Continental Europe in 79? In my opinion, he definitely is. I think that the older guys, you know, maybe guys like Lanny and Kite and Irwin could address that uh, probably better than I could, but for sure. Well, I think when all of Europe was included, but Seve always will be the spiritual leader of that team. And there's the ghost of Seve, I think is real for the European players. And they'll draw on his patriotism and enthusiasm forever. So he made the biggest difference. He was the one, you know, that really wanted to include all of Europe. It was 1985 when they broke their long streak of not winning. 87, they celebrated on our soil. And, you know, this group of guys that took it personal, you know, Paven and Calc and Freddie, and there was a bunch of us. Um, we showed up in 89 after they, you know, had that big celebration at Jack's place. And in 91, man, uh, our guys showed up in camo and that was it uh i didn't wear the camo because i didn't like it at the time um it seemed like i would have been the front runner with the camo but i wasn't and uh yeah i know they'll show that footage i still have the golf balls i still have the golf balls um that that chip and i used and you know made that we kind of did make an error there 
but they tried to claim three holes on us. It was pretty, I'll, I'm sure I'll explain it on air live. It was, it was an incredible match. I have uh, about every detail memorized. And uh, unfortunately, Seve's not here to share his side, but Jose's around. There's been books written all about Keel in 91. And it was awesome. I mean, the pressure was so amped up for all of us. And yet we played the best golf of our life. Uh, on a golf course that was unfamiliar to everybody and was so rugged. It was, as you said, Dan, it was, it was like a Hollywood script. You know, I was talking to Phil Mickelson on the, the, the first program that we did, and I asked him if he had a theory on why Europe has been so good. And he pointed primarily to their camaraderie, the, the fact that they are, there is, there is an ease that they have with each other. What, what is your feeling about why they've done so well? Well, I, I think that he nailed it. I think that that, and I think Zinger will probably speak to that in even more detail, but I think uh, from through the years, I just think that, and it, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's the case of Europe wants to win it more than the United States. You hear that a lot. I just think that they are in such belief of themselves now. And I tell you what, how powerful is that? How, how powerful is it just kind of knowing mm -hmm. you're going to go out as an under in a freewheeling type of atmosphere. And you just kind of know, you look around at your mates and you look at the rest of those, you look at your 12 guys in that room and you just feel and know you're going to win. And that takes a lot of pressure off. And I think on the flip side of it, we've seen an underperforming U S side by, by and large, like huge favorites. And this, this one might have the most disparity yet of, when you look at the world rankings of the U S the average rankings like nine and you've got like, you know, you look at the world rankings for Europe, it looks like they've got no chance, but they love it. They love that situation. And I think, I think the camaraderie is infectious, contagious and on and on and on when an avalanche of momentum gets going, it's hard to stop. And that has been Europe. Paul, the 2008, is that the primary reason why you instituted the pod system try, to try to understand personalities better that, that gelled with each other? Absolutely it was. We'd lost four out of five going into our Ryder Cup, and we, I think I think we'd lost uh, seven out of nine. I felt like when we won, we kind of bought the PJ of America two or three more years to kind of sell the event, and then Davis won, and then two or three more years to sell the event. And then, you know, every once in a while, you got to win, but they have a huge edge on us. Um, you know, we've had two players tell Hicks and I both, they take their egos off at the door. They try to make each other better and, you know, in the room and he's right. I mean, they're confident. They have all kinds of self-belief, but I, I think this year is going to be different. The American team has six guys that have never been there before. That's what we had in 08. Those six guys don't have any scar tissue. They just have memories of the guys older than them getting trounced and they want to spin it around. And I believe the American team will go out there and beat the European team this year. Um, they're just nowhere near as good. And that's just what I think is going to happen. So whether or not that buys the American or the PGA of America a few more years to sell the event or if it can become a pattern, I don't know. Europe's got our number, but I believe this year it's going to end. You know, Dan, when you look at the American team, uh, Europe through the years, it always seems like they've had a touchstone. They've had at least one or two guys that, that, that felt like the centerpiece of their teams. Does the United States possess somebody like that? Uh, that's a really good question. I think it's, uh, it's also a milestone that the U.S. for the first time doesn't have anybody in their 40s, right? So there's mm -hmm. no Phil Mickelson. There's no Tiger Woods. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm just, look, I'm just going over the roster in my head. You know, from the Yacht picks that Stricker had six and then the new blood that he kind of filtered in with the six captain's picks. I don't think there's any any stalwart that's like the, the Ryder Cup stud for the U.S. that, uh, you know, Jordan Spieth has played. Look, look, look at the situation he's in. He's coming back this year. He's he's kind of built his golf game back. Is he going to be Ryder Cup ready? Um, you know, you look at Dustin Johnson. You look at Colin Morikawa, who didn't play the best going into the into the FedEx Cup playoffs. Um I don't, I don't think there's anybody that you can really point to on the U.S. side, but then you look at the European side and you look at Sergio and you look at Poulter, who are captain's picks, by the way. And then you look at John Rahm, the number one player in the world. I think he's, I think he's built for this event. I mean, we, we saw him cry in Paris when he beat Tiger on Sunday singles. 
I mean, he is, is a, he, he's caught the Ryder Cup, you know, uh, fever from Sergio and all the rest of the guys. So they are a dangerous, dangerous group. So if I think you look at anybody that's kind of a stalwart, I think I think the Europeans uh, have them. You know, Paul, to, to what Dan was saying, I agree that Europe has guys, and even Rory. Rory is, you know, he has uh, digested this thing and is all invested in it, and, and I think that he will be ready to go. The omission of Patrick Reed, did it make sense to you when Steve Stricker made that choice? Definitely. Uh, some of it is endurance. You know, you don't know if a guy's got – that bilateral pneumonia, how many points can he get you? How many matches can he possibly play? And you just have to, you know, his personality is such that you want him there. Um, but you, you got to have a guy that can go four matches at least. And uh, so, yeah, that'll be tough. Europe does bring so much self-belief and confidence into this event. And I think what we're going to see now is uh, w- with respect to the world ranking, if confidence and self-belief can trump raw overall talent and that's what this is going to be a battle of to me uh i think the talent's going to beat the self-belief but i, I may be wrong uh i just can't see those europeans as, as polished and as confident as they are overcoming what america has to offer but dan isn't all this kind of what you we're talking about how they feed off of this while knowing deep down we know how uptight you Americans are, and we know that all of this fodder is going to lend itself to guys like Poulter and Sergio, and you can go on down the line. Uh, John Rahm, they're going to say, yeah, we own you. We own you. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's exactly what Zinger described. I think that it's the, it's the long time setup now. It's no different. And again, it might even be a bigger mountain to climb for Europe because of the disparity between the, the world rankings and the level of players. But, um, you know, you, you, you look at the U.S. side, too. You've got a lot of guys in there for the very first time. Scheffler, who I know Zinger is a huge fan of. And I know that he was happy to see Scotty Scheffler pick. And so was I. Guy hasn't won a golf tournament um, on the PGA Tour. That's not sliding Scheffler, but this is going to be an arena where he's not even close to knowing how his body's <laughs> going to react when he gets on that first tee. So this is what makes the Ryder Cup the Ryder Cup, right? This is the script. You've got David and Goliath again on paper. You've got a European team that says, we got them right where we want them, and let's get it on. Paul, Steve Stricker's role, since you've done this and done it successfully, what is the most important thing that he has to achieve this this week? Number one is he has to get the players prepared to know that golf course and they're doing that as we speak. First and foremost, there's no shortcut to success. You can't hope for it. You can't wish for it. You have to prepare. And he knows that. So he's got his guys there. They have to know the course better than the other team. That's number one. And the other thing I feel Stricker has already done is he's gotten the players invested in this team by giving them ownership and who got picked and like a lot of the decisions, and that's a big part of it. The players have to be invested and they have to feel like they have ownership and you're not talking down to them. But if you can get them all engaged and out prepared, you know, if, if they can know the greens the best, that's what it's going to take. Because look, all the pep talks and all the motivational videos and flag waving is great. But in the end, you got to make a putt. It's going to come down to who makes the putt and who misses the putt. And what was said in the team room the night before might not, I don't know how that helps. You know, Dan, as far as the crowds, there have been some great crowds this year, the latter part of, of the season on the PGA tour, but, but the indoctrination of a lot of these players to this environment, how important is that for, for you and and the broadcast and, and Tommy Roy and Tom Randolph to, to portray that and to show, you know, that this is full contact golf, as close as golf can get. Yeah, uh, we just turn the cameras on and throw the audio up and things happen. Still to this day, I've done hundreds and hundreds of golf tournaments and championships through the years and Zingers played in a million of them. Uh, the loudest roars, it's not even close by far on a Ryder Cup venue. The loudest roars that I've ever heard on the golf course was Hazeltine in 2016 when the U.S. Um, got the job done there. 
This is, as scheduled, going to be full throat, 35,000, 40,000 people. And when these guys get on that first tee, and I don't even care if you're the veterans, right, Zing? I mean, you get on that first tee, and then you're a rookie, and you're hearing this stuff for the first time, you, it, can, it can go one of two ways. It can just stun you out of your skin, or you can be one of those guys that we say through the years is wired for a Ryder Cup like you were, Zing. And by the way, I've been waiting to do a Ryder Cup with Zing for a long, long time. Yes. Ever since, ever since Zinger was announced as our analyst at NBC, and I believe October of 2018, we had to, you know, wait and wait. And then we got last year canceled. And I think that the folks are going to hear Zinger at his absolute best. I cannot wait to get next to him during a Ryder Cup and just see him come out of his skin at Whistling Straits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe the speaker will show <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you, you, I mean, you, you say, and I, I, I love this line that, that, you know, pros choke over two things, cash and prestige. Well, the cash isn't on the line this week and the prestige, they're accustomed to the prestige being about an individual resume. So what is it about this event that, that gets them in the short ones? Patriotism is the third thing they choke for, but that mm -hmm. only comes every so often. And uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you're right, though, Dan. I mean, when you get on that first tee, I, I've played in several, and every single time it, it gets you, and it does affect people differently. I think it's important for Stricker to let his rookies know um, that this is full-blown show-off mode. They came out here to watch you because they think you're awesome. And I had uh, – I felt a responsibility – for every player on my team to have confidence in my confidence in them. That was a big part of what I tried to sell to those guys. And I think that's, that's part of what Stricker needs to do to get the rookies ready for that first tee, because that is an experience, like Dan said, you don't know how your body's going to react. And it can go one way or the other. And uh, personally, I think that they're all ready for it. They're all prepared for it in their head, and they can handle it with or without Stricker. But a, good, a nice little warning or a nice little, hey, let's show off today could make all the difference. Dan, the, the dynamic of Kepkin and, and DeChambeau uh, is something that, that Steve Stricker is going to have to answer to uh, virtually every presser leading up to Friday morning. Um, I, I would imagine he's going to handle it with aplomb. But as far as those two, do you think that either one of them will make any public gesture to say, look, we're good this week? Yeah, I've, I've, I already know that Stricker's called both of them and has expressed to each and each of them how he expects their behavior to be. And this was a while back, so we really haven't heard any or seen any tweets from, from Kepka. Uh, we haven't heard much talk about it because I think Stricker was serious about it. He says, guys, if you want to get to that back to that, uh, that stuff, just, you know, don't save it for the Ryder Cup. Let it go beyond. So uh, I don't think it's going to be a huge factor. They're not going to be paired together. Um, I think it's public. It's just with simple. I don't think that's going to be a factor. So as long as they're okay in the team room, I don't see how it's going to affect. I mean, Kepka's a business-like guy. He wants to go out there and get stuff done. I think they're going to go about their business. I don't know. Zing, what, what do you think? Do you think that this will be a factor in the team room uh, in a negative thing? Or do you think both guys, as they've, as they've, you know, conducted themselves recently is going to be a professional kind of relationship and it's not going to affect the way things happen. Well, it better not. That's the way I look at it. I, if those two messed up that team room in any way, they would get slaughtered for it. So <laughs> I, well, I would say, I feel like that uh, Kepka and Bryson can put the United States on their shoulders and carry that team. You know, um, it just dawned on me as you were talking, Dan, I, I really believe that Bryson is going to end up being the team leader. You know, that guy loves the USGA. He loves the PGA of America. He's squeaky clean. You know, it feels like in every aspect, he's creative. He's exhausting. He's brilliant. You know, he's everything. And, um, but I have a sneaky feeling he's going to have a hard time, you know, holding back what he feels about what he's about to do. And it's going to be great, I feel. And, um, but those two to me, they'll, they'll be a royal pain in the neck or they're going to put the team on their back. One or the other, I don't think they're going to ever be a pain in the neck, not this day and age. I believe that they'll bond in some capacity and something good's going to come from it, especially if they win it. If they win it, they'll always be bonded. Hey, you yeah. know what, if Gary, if, uh, if, if, if the U.S. wins and everybody's hugging each other and Tommy Roy and the people in the truck, right, Zing, <laughs> get that shot, that money shot of the Shambo and Kepka giving each other a bear hug, how unbelievable would that be? 
the power of the Ryder Cup at another level, right? Chill bump. I just chill bumping right there. The possibility. <laughs> I mean, that would be unbelievable for the sport, right? And if it, oh, like, it, as, as you say, Zing, if it bonds these guys, how great would that be? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, in talking to Mickelson, and I was asking him about the evolution of his relationship with, with Tiger, and he talked about a Hazeltine in 2016 and the sharing of thoughts uh, and strategizing. And, and there is nothing more rewarding than collective achievement. And these guys get to experience it so rarely that it, it I think, will foster emotion that we're unaccustomed to seeing from any of them. Let me get you out of here on this. The, the, at the end of the day, late Sunday, Dan, what are we going to look at? Are we, are we looking at a 15, 13, 14 and a half, 13 and a half? Is it going to be nip and tuck again? Well, from a television aspect and an entertainment aspect, I hope it comes down to the final putt and somebody's got the final putt to decide the Ryder Cup. That's what you owe. Um, I think it's going to be close. I do. I think it's going to be close. I, I tend to agree with Zinger. I think there's so much firepower on this U.S. side, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a big, huge ballpark at Whistling Straits. I think it would take an unbelievable effort, um, underdog effort by Europe to come out on top here. I do think it's going to be relatively close, but you know, I, I just have a good feeling about the Americans this time around, but I, I do think it's going to be close. I do. Paul? Well, so much is made of Friday, Saturday, but really it's the 12 matches on Sunday too. Um, and America's just too strong, I feel, on Sunday. And if they are ahead after Saturday, then I think the U.S. will be comfortable winning this event. But generally, <laughs> Europe's been ahead, you know, or right on their heels. I, but I just can't see the Americans not winning. I really feel like it's time for them. This is a new generation. It's a new time. And uh, whether it becomes a pattern or, or sustainable, I don't know. But the U.S., I believe, will come out on top. Well, it is golf's most glorious television experience. Uh, Dan, can, can you, we get a dedicated camera in the booth. You give a couple booth shots occasionally during the broadcast. We need to see the visceral reaction of this gentleman. No, you don't. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we had the rowdy, we had the rowdy cam yes. at the Olympics for Olympic swimming. I think we need the uh, little lipstick camera on Zinger. <laughs> I don't know if the top Tommy Roy will allow it, but uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be looking over there. Obviously, I think he, I think it's going to be an incredible experience to do it with Zing. I know he, this, this event is such a huge part of him, his career, you know, player and captain. Um, cannot get to Whistling Straits to to hear what he has to say about it and watch this whole thing develop. Well, we're, we're excited for it. All the coverage, NBC Golf Channel and Peacock, Dan and Paul. Thank you both very much. Have a great week. Thanks, Thanks. Gary. Pleasure being with you. Well, a big thank you again to Dan Hicks and to Paul Azinger. They are going to be omnipresent on the television side for this Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits, the men who will anchor the coverage. And, Paul, there's probably nothing that gets him more lathered up than this competition. And Dan has called some of the biggest sporting events in the world over the last 20 years, and he is great at capturing the moment. So thank you again to Dan Hicks and Paul Isinger, and thank you to you guys out there for listening. We'll see you next week on the Five Club Conversation with Gary Williams.